Over 1.5 million African Americans served during World War I and World War II. And not one of them would receive our nation's highest honor until decades later, including a man from New York. Boston's Christina Chiarelli has that story. Sergeant Henry Johnson was one of thousands of African Americans serving in World War I. The Albany native was recommended for a Medal of Honor, but would never see it. He died in 1929 from 21 combat-related injuries, jobless and homeless. There was segregation, and we know that segregation then leads to injustice, racism, and that's what we've uncovered here, and that's why now we're setting the record straight. In 1986, Joe Dio a former New York congressman, began fighting to get black American war heroes the recognition they deserve, gathering information on Johnson that would be passed on to the Senate. These two volumes were submitted by Senator Chuck Schumer to the Army in 2011. Hundreds of pages making a case for Johnson and why he deserved the Medal of Honor. Earlier this month, Johnson finally received our nation's highest military honor posthumously, almost 100 years later. Henry was one of the first Americans to read France's highest award for valor. But his own nation didn't award him anything. I think people are going to see this as an important case to make for many more black American soldiers so that we can finally say we've erased this egregious stain of racial injustice. Nine black soldiers from around the country serving in both world wars have at last been given the medal, but Dio Guardi says many more African Americans deserve the medal and his work is far from over. In Austin, in Christina Chiarelli, Fios, One News. Surrounded by veterans, Mount Vernon Mayor Ernie Davis and former Westchester Congressman Joe Diaguardi unveiling a new Thank plaque you. to honor World War I African American soldier Sergeant Henry Johnson a war hero who was denied the nation's highest honor, the Medal of Honor, because of his color. Out of the one and a half million African Americans who served in World War I and World War II, not one of them was ever given the Medal of Honor. And that's a statistic that Joe Diaguardi just couldn't ignore. Stereotyping doesn't work for anybody. It's unjust. And no matter what your, your ethnic or racial or you name it, uh, I think America deserves better. Since 1986, Diaguardi has taken on the military to posthumously deliver the Medal of Honor to those who have been denied for decades. He was made aware of the issue in 1986 by Dr. Leroy Ramsey, whose son was here to see his father's dream come true. To see justice prevail after all of these decades, I cannot come up with the words to explain how good that makes me feel. And veterans agree. Unfortunately, it took that much time to get it, but it's finally being done. You know, justice is finally being served. Soldiers who battled for our freedom now being recognized for their service and not by the color of their skin. In Mount Vernon, Tim Cassidy, News 12. And I'm so glad, being in politics, that there exists a person in the ilk of uh, Joe Diaguardi. And not only has he championed a cause, he did not give up. And in the darkest hours, I know he must have thought, how long uh, will it take? But as they say in church, how long? Not long. And he deserves our gratitude. He deserves our standing ovation for this person, the congressman, coming here uh, to exalt uh, the proposition uh, that all men are created equal. So please, let's rise to our feet for our congressman, Joe Diaguardi. Mayor. You know, looking back, that was 1986 when Dr. Leroy Ramsey, your dad, Julia, and your dad, David, came to visit me in my office. And I knew he was connected to Mount Vernon. He knew I was the congressman representing Mount Vernon. And he said to me, he says, Joe, I've been working several years on this. I, I'm a black historian, African-American historian, and I'm concentrating now on correcting racial injustice in the military. And he said to me, did you know, well, first of all, I had Mayor, uh, Mario Cuomo send a letter 
to every one of the Congress people in our state. Now, back then, we had 34. Ruth, we're down to 27 now. We're losing a little voice in Washington. We're, we're not growing as fast as the rest of the country. That's the problem. In any case, he came to tell me that I was the only one to answer that letter. And, I said, and he gave it to me. And I said, well, I'm honored to hear that, but tell me why is it that you came to visit me and what do you think I can do? He says, well, do you know that a million five hundred and fifty thousand African Americans served in World War I and World War II and not one, not one got our nation's highest military award, honor, which is called the Medal of Honor. In fact, many people know of it as the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's really the Medal of Honor. I said, well, you know, I didn't understand how that could happen. I'm a CPA and those numbers just don't add up. What, what's going on here? He said, well, do you know that there was segregation in World War I and World War II? I said, you know, I'm a poor kid from the Bronx. We moved here. My parents are immigrants when I was about 16. And I have 16 years of great education and no one ever taught me that. I said, you're, you're telling me this is racism. Well, they don't like to call it that in the military. I said, well, if you want me to get involved in you, we got to think straight and talk straight. That's who I am. We're going to call it what it is. It's racism, which means that people who were qualified were subjectively determined not to qualify for our nation's highest award. It's not easy to get a Medal of Honor. But when you have a million, 550,000 Americans of color and several hundred were recommended and not one gets it, come on. There's something wrong there. And I said, you know what? We're going to work on this together. So I immediately reached out. You need a strategy for everything. I went to the head of the Black Caucus in Congress, Mickey Leland. Now, did I know that Mickey already was thinking of a Medal of Honor for someone in his district in Houston? His name is Seaman Dory Miller, World War II. Died in, was it? it was Pearl Harbor. His commanding officer died. And in those days, if you were an African-American, black American, and you were in the Navy, you served in the kitchen. He came out of the kitchen, close to where his commanding officer was mortally wounded, and then died right on the spot, picks up a gun, and shoots down four Japanese zeros. He's got a, I, I'm using this example, I'll get back to Henry Johnson in a minute, but to show you how crazy this gets, they named a, 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 a warship after him, they have a stamp after him, Admiral Nimitz weighed in for him, and they refused to give him our country's highest award. He's the next one on my list because in memory of Mickey Leland, guess what? We visit, we visit with Secretary of Defense, 1988, and we tell them what we're going to do. We said, we're now going to get 218 signatures in the House, and that means we're going to issue the medals without the military, and I believe the President will do it. We got up to 170, and we get a call from the Secretary of Defense. And we go to his office, me and Mickey, and he says, do you think you're doing the right thing? How do you know that there isn't or there aren't other African Americans that deserve it more or just as much? I said, well, I hadn't thought of it that way, but what, what are you suggesting, Mr. Secretary? He said, why don't we pull those signatures and let's think about this calmly? And why don't you let me give a grant to a black university, they picked Shaw University, to study those African Americans who received our second highest award and find out why they didn't get the first. Well, that to me sounded pretty logical. And I said, well, how long is that going to take? Well, it'll take a couple of years. Well, it took eight years. And that, by that time, I was out of Congress, and they thought they had gotten rid of me. But they didn't know that I was writing articles, I was visiting people, I was on TV shows. You're talking about this ridiculous injustice this big stain on America. It's bad enough we had slavery in America, but when you think about a million, 550,000 African Americans risking their lives and not one gets our nation's highest award, that was enough to get me going. So what happened was they then found that seven, well, it should have been World War I, World War II, Navy and Army, somehow they dumbed it down to just World War II, and you may know, it's in the book, that President Clinton presented seven more medals in 1997. A year before that, I got very close to your dad. He, he came to visit me many times, even 
when I wasn't a congressman, he was so frustrated by this that he didn't think anything was going to happen except that we found one by accident, by the way. The first one, Corporal Freddie Stower in South Carolina, 1991. I get a call from the White House. They said, in the course of this study that was started in 1989, we found a file that didn't have denied on it. No one acted on it. And as president, I want to issue the medal. Can you come here in two weeks? I said, yes, I can. So the first was George H.W. Bush in April of 1991, first medal of honor. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Bush. Carl. Well, welcome to the White House and I salute the Vice President, Mrs. Quayle, and Secretary Cheney, other members of our cabinet, and General Bono, and distinguished members of Congress who are with us today, and uh, former Congressman Joe Diagardi. I'm especially glad uh, Joe's with us here today. To the former Medal of Honor re recipients, I salute each and every one of you. Uh, to Georgina Palmer and Mary Bowens, the sisters of today's honoree, are with us. And don't they look lovely? We're just delighted. We want to honor a true hero, a man who makes us proud of our heritage as Americans, a man who, in life and death, uh, helped keep America free. I speak of Corporal Freddie Stowers, to whom, posthumously, we present our highest military award for valor, the Medal of Honor. It's an award for bravery and conscience, that compendium uh, we call character. Today, Corporal Freddie Stowers becomes the first black soldier honored with a Medal of Honor from World War I. He sought and helped achieve the triumph of a of right over wrong, he showed, as this year has proved again, that an inspired human heart can surmount bayonets and barbed wire. Seventy-three years ago, the corporal first was recommended for a Medal of Honor, but his award was not acted upon. In 1987, then Congressman Joe Diogardi and uh, my friend, the late Mickey Leland, known to many here from Houston, discovered the Stowers case while conducting other research. And the Army took up the case. And last November, the secretaries of the Army and Defense recommended that Corporal Stowers receive the Medal of Honor. I heard his story, accepted their recommendation enthusiastically. And now, after all the work, now, how did this happen? It happened because when we ended up with an African-American president, and I knew Chuck Schumer very well. My wife, Shirley, a human, Shirley, stand up. We're human rights activists. There are a lot of Albanians here, I see. And we saved the Albanian people from genocide in Kosovo. What happened in Srebrenica was going to happen there. But what, what I'm saying is we needed to understand the environment that existed at that time. And I then said, once we had an African-American president, let me go to my good friend Chuck Schumer, who works very closely with me and Shirley on that, and say to him, you've got power. You are a senior senator in New York. You have now the, the, the power to do something if you go to Barack Obama. He said, well, can't do that. We've got to make the case. So I gave him my files. And for eight years, his staff worked on it and came up with two volumes about three or four inches thick. And that was submitted in 2011. It took another four years for them to decide that they're finally, a case was finally made and we're going to do it. And that's how we got Sergeant Henry Johnson. Well, who's Henry Johnson? Well, 
he's a guy that was so brave, and his unit was so brave, that France, in those days, if you had a segregated division, they didn't serve under white generals. They were sent to France to fight in Europe, and they were serving under French generals. Well, they served so well that his entire unit, that part of the 369th that they gave a parade to, and it's, you'll see the, the uh, picture in my little book on the inside of the front cover, on Fifth Avenue, they were given by France, France's highest award. It's called the Cross of War, Croix de Guerre. But Henry, uh, Sergeant Johnson was so brave, they put a palm leaf on him. That means that's extraordinary bravery beyond the call of duty. Figuring he's going to get this Fifth Avenue parade, he might then, since he was recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor, along with others in his unit, he couldn't get it because of segregation and racism. But what did he do? He saved his unit. He was so alert, he heard the bushes rustling, and there was a German platoon marching on his unit, and most of these men were asleep. And one was injured already, uh, his friend Needham. He went out uh, alone with a gun and intimidated 16 Germans. He killed four of them. They shot him multiple times. His gun was misplaced in the battle. He had a bolo knife, and he went after them with the knife. And the eyewitnesses said, you didn't see anything like Henry Johnson. He was like a wildcat. He just knew what to do, and he was going to do it, even if he died. He saved his buddy, Needham, who gave the account. You need an eyewitness, and, and it still didn't work back then. But we're doing today, Mayor, what should have been done in 1918 and 1919. The thing that really got me going for Henry Johnson was that he died homeless and penniless on the streets of Washington, D.C., looking for a pension during the Depression. Would you believe that? And they didn't know who he was, and when he died, they buried him in Potter's Field. It took some action before me to get him out and put him in, even before he got the medal, to bury him in Arlington Cemetery. And then they gave him the Purple Heart, and they thought that was all they were going to do until I discovered Dr. Ramsey, and he inspired me. And when, I, when I'm inspired, I, I get on fire. That's the way my parents raised me. That if there's injustice anywhere, as Martin Luther King said, then we need to change it. With that, I just want to say how happy I am to be here with my friends and family and you, Mayor. You took the challenge, and thank you so much for your compassion and for praising a Republican today. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's time that the accounting profession, uh, specifically certified public accountants, took a bigger role in government, not only in the legislative process here in Washington, but even at the local levels because of the problems that the cities are having today, uh, balancing their, their books, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we need more planning. And I think uh, it's, it's right to have uh, CPA stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other professions in, the, in this process. Now, here you are, a, 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 a pharmacist serving in the Congress, and one of the principal areas that you have been interested in, as I understand it, has been the, the area overall of hunger. That's correct, Les. Uh, as you know, we created last year the Select Committee on Hunger, and the Speaker was kind enough to appoint me as Chairman of that Select Committee. 
So my pursuits uh, have served uh, in the highest priority in that arena. And I'm very, very happy about uh, some of the things that we've done thus far. My charge is to uh, analyze the circumstances of the hunger problems, hunger and malnutrition, both in, uh, in this country, our domestic interest, and also in the world. And if, as you know, Lester, there have been some very severe problems on the continent of Africa. More specifically, about 35 to 40 million people are at risk right now of dying of starvation. Uh, I just recently came back from Ethiopia, where the problem is most severe and in the most massive numbers than any other country in the world. Well, my hero Winston Churchill once commented that courage is the greatest of all human virtues because it's the one that makes all the others possible. Well, that was certainly the case for the Democratic congressman from Houston, Texas. He had the courage not just to do the right thing, to fight for the right causes, but also to recruit others to the cause, Republicans as well as Democrats, lower-level staff guys as well as big-name politicians. He made you feel that you were part of something good, that you were good yourself just for being part of it, even if you were just tagging along. Mickey's been gone from us now for 20 years, but his cause to give food to the hungry is as vital and noble and, yes, as wonderful as it was back when we could still see his smiling face.